you think there is no other way. But there is, isn't there, Nima? So it's great to have uh, Nima Hadari back and yet another top surgeon from East London. Uh, Nima's particularly um, uh, well-placed to talk to us about management of pedon fractures is because his practice is also very largely foot and ankle. So great to have you back. Brilliant. Mick, th thank you very much, and thank you very much for the committee at the RSM for inviting me. So I'm the heretic, as it appears today, talking about using circular devices to fix these fractures. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to start off by saying that one thing we don't really talk about, and we should, are two things. One is the skill set of the practitioner. And don't forget that Mike has been a consultant for over 15 years. He has had the expertise and the experience and the, and the, and actually the, the ability to learn from his experience over a very prolonged period of time. I've been a consultant for 10 years and I've done very much, you know, very similar things. You know, I've, it, essentially my skill set is quite narrow in this area. So actually being able to separate that is very difficult. So the message that I give you may not actually apply necessarily to what you're able to do. So my disclosures, I work with various companies uh, with regards to consultancy and education, as you can see. Um, I'm going to talk about um, frames or ORIF a little bit, when in my hand the frame makes sense, how I do it, uh, and, and there are cases in to disperse to try and uh, show us some of the t uh, some of these details. When we're talking about um, frames versus ORIF, it's it's one of those things that the studies that are out there they don't really give us a very good answer. The numbers are small. The different sets of patients are being assigned to different groups. There is huge selection bias in all of these. By the way, I'm talking mostly about the type C fractures here because that is what the frame is much better for, at least those ones with a metaphyseal diaphyseal dissociation. Also, you look at some of these studies, uh, malunions are high, they're high in both plate fixation and there are more infections in plate fixations, less infection in frames, although it's interesting from the stuff that we've had earlier on. And actually, some of the frames are not necessarily what we use today. They are spanning fixators and they're hybrid fixators, which are very different with the um, circular frames. Um, one of the best ones is probably this last one with Bacon from injury in 2008, um, where they, you know, with the non-spanning fine wire frame, again, you know, increased non-union and mal mal malunions in the ORIF group. What does that mean? Again, it's, it's difficult to discern because the numbers are quite small. Currently in the UK, we're running a trial where we are randomizing these type C closed fractures to frame fixation and plate fixation. Uh, this is um, Heman Sharma's baby, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the data coming out of that one. We're one of the uh, centers uh, that are recruiting for it. So when do frames make sense? As part of it, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the stage protocol uh, because this paper by Sirkin is one of the classics. I mean, I advise you to be aware of it. And what they showed is that there is a huge reduction in complication of the soft tissues if you spanned it and you allowed time before you went in and fixed these fractures. Again, there are nuances to this, which I'm not going to discuss. Very briefly, how what I like from a spanning fixator, this is the zone of injury. We've got to be outside of that. This is the zone of surgery. We have to be outside of that because I don't want any of my colleagues who like plating these to have pin sites which are overlapping their plate fixation and also to protect the heel. You have to have a little uh, kickstand to keep the heel off the bed. And also, I do like midfoot fixation because if you're waiting for a prolonged period of time, patients do get a midfoot plantaris, which is very difficult to for it to come out, which is an unfortunate problem with a non-load bearing soft tissue. So then, when does the definitive circular frame matter? Soft tissue compromise. It's all about the soft tissues. The soft tissue around the distal tibia is incredibly precious. There isn't very much of it and replacing it requires a skill set that absolutely requires a plastic surgeon. 
Here is a typical example, 50-year-old female tripped on the stairs, closed distal uh, tibial fracture. This is one of the ones um, that this is a kind of type C fracture, if you like, it's a distal tibia. But the problem here is that this is seven days after the event. This leg has been wrung like a towel. She has uh, delamination of the various layers of her soft tissues because of the rotational injury, and it takes an awfully long time to settle down. This is at 14 days. I still wouldn't be happy. You can see the soft tissue swelling has gone down, but I still wouldn't necessarily think about putting internal metal work in. So we bit the bullet, and on day 20, she had a circular frame. This is still 10 weeks down the line. Um, five months down the line, thankfully, she's healed. So this is, a, this is a place with the soft tissue compromise where in our unit it works very well. The other one is where you have got metaphyseal comminution. Here is um, because one of the issues that we see in plate fixation with the matter when you've got a huge amount of metaphyseal comminution, the metaphyseal block and the articular surface heals well, but there is non-union at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. Also, um, we've got this is again a patient. You can see from the soft tissues here that have I got a laser. You can see from the soft tissue shadow here from on, on the CT scan, um, this is a eight year old man ran over by an ambulance. Again, horrendous soft tissue injury um, due to cultural issues. They were not in favor of doing an amputation. And in this age group, if you do an amputation, they will never walk again. They will just die in bed. Midfoot fractures, Comminution at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. Also, don't forget host factors. He will not have very good healing potential. You can see the artifact from the spanning external fixator already on this chap's leg. So, you know, what are the options for this, uh, for this patient? We decided to go for a frame fixation. And of course, one of the things that this allows you uh, is to allow to bear load almost immediately. So day two, this 80-year-old man is immediately out of bed. There is a huge move towards bearing load on fixed limbs really early on. But although we say it, not many people do it. One of the things is that majority of frame surgeons do do it. Five months post-op, he's gone on to have a non-union here. Um, is it delayed? Is it, is it not delayed? But it requires something doing. So we've resected a small portion of fibula. We have compressed it. And at eight months postoperatively, um, he's got a relatively good alignment of his tibia. He's mobilizing, he's walking, and we haven't required any dramatic surgery beyond that. One of the other um, reasons that I would use a frame is the unreconstructable joint. As a foot and ankle surgeon, because my elective side I do foot and ankle surgery, it is a um, it genuinely is a terrible thing to have to take out multiple plates from a distal tibia and then fuse an ankle. It is a merciless, merciless operation, and um, both for the surgeon and the soft tissues of the patients. So when I know that they're you know we're beyond salvage. So for example, forty two year old man ex fixed in France returned to the UK eight weeks before he came to see me. So this is unfortunately now an unreconstructable joint. What are the options for him? You know, what, what are the things that we can do? The tibia tailor joint is really not very good, but his subtalar joint is well preserved. And I know this is something that Ennis is going to talk about, but very briefly about, you know, I, again, uh, you know, do arthroscopic preparation of the joint, put a frame on and um, fuse his ankle at the same time as dealing with the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, um, he's able to bear load and he has got a definitive fixation with a stiff ankle, which is pain free. A little bit about how I do it. You need a setup. You need to know how to do it and you need to have the right tools. You also need to have the right personnel. Lovely paper by Mike Whitehouse and James Livingston, one of the people who trained me, using a large frame. So these are femoral arches. This is a Russian trick. So you can suspend the limb in the operating theater, and you can then go on to build a frame inside this frame. 
Um, this is a very powerful device. This I use this all the time. So this is part of my uh, OR setup. The next thing is that you really have to study um, your scans. You really need to know what to do. The idea of reducing the articular surface accurately is not mitigated by you using a frame. You still have to do that. And here, my planning would be, that's the tibialis anterior. This is the extensor hallucis longus. I do an incision directly into the fracture to be able to see it so that I can reduce it and, um, and fix it with very low periarticular screws and then mount a frame to neutralize it. Uh, in fact, very similar uh, principles to exactly what Mike was describing using internal fixation. Um, and this is some time down the line. This is just to demonstrate that the articular surface is actually healing and it is nicely reduced. And here he is at some months down the line with the, uh, with the frame removed. The thing to think about are the safe corridors. You have to know cross-sectional anatomy of the distal tibia to be able to, uh, to do this. And here we are. This is a frame. The wires that I put on are usually the reference wire going across, the, the two parallel wires, wires that cross at 90 degrees. And here is one. Uh, I was going to show this to Lyndon, actually. This is for his posterior malleolus, just to make sure you capture that. You can do that with an olive wire. The reason you need a wide crossing angle is because you need to have stability in multiple directions. The narrower the crossing angle, the more likely it is that you will slide and rotate on your fragment, making it an unstable fixation. The other thing is, with this, these are where the struts sit. So if your uh, fixation goes to these places, you then use a slave ring, and this is the second ring. This is purely for the application of the hexapod to be able to, um, to affect any corrections post-operatively. And again, here is another example uh, of a slave ring. In fact, this was put on by one of my previous fellows. You can see that this is the wrong way around. I didn't recognize this till I gave him a program and corrected him the wrong way. But the reason he put these here is because the fixation is where your, uh, your hexapod would go. Another thing is that we worry about the reflections of the uh, ankle joint capsule. Um, there is a lot of lovely studies about that, to be honest with you, and it goes antrolaterally. This is, it goes quite a long way up antrolaterally. Um, so antrolateral up to uh, 12 millimeters. Um, but we tend to ignore this because with a fracture, everything is interconnected anyway. So in summary, we use it for temporary stabilization. This is, this is important. Uh, and for the definitive treatment, I think about the soft tissue compromise when there is bone loss and metaphyseal comminution and in the unreconstructable joint where I know that I'll be the one having to fuse this patient's ankle. Thank you very much. Yeah. Fantastic. How to do it. Um, Neymar, with the advent of the mini plating systems, rather than just single internal fixation, have you used little plates along the rim, and around the back? I have it, but I mean, I, I, can, I can really see the, the, the lure of doing that because there are circumstances where you get that anterior rim comminution, and you can see that actually having a, a plate as a good washer and rafter of screws going going across would be very useful. And what's your indication for including the foot in your frame? Does everybody I'm, get a foot ring? Or? So to be honest, more and more I'm doing it. So I include the foot and I distract the joint uh, a few millimeters and I allow them to bear load almost immediately. Um, in the more, um, in the poorer bone quality, so in the elderly patients where it may not necessarily be such a good uh, bone quality, Again, I include the foot, and the main reason is that they, it's actually slightly more comfortable to at least to bear load, uh, to stand, to transfer when the, when the foot is included. But it comes off at about six weeks. Yeah, and uh, avoid aquinas deformity as well. So, Mike, can I ask you, you saw those hemorrhagic blisters, that degloving. Are you gonna? Who are you going to call, or are you going to put your plates in? Um, should I just show it? Yep, yeah, it's behind you. Um, so the, the, 
the, the, the, um, the, that one you showed with the delaminated skin. So for us, regardless of how that heals, again, thinking of rehabbing that person, assuming they're not bed bound, that heals with what we would table unstable scar. So stuff that continues to crack and break down. Yeah. So that one primarily, again, it's a setup I have. We would discuss it, but almost certainly we would excise the area and then flap it straight as a primary procedure. So when we get those late ones where they've been walking on it, or they're, they're, and often there's a, there's a degree of compromise, either supertentorial for whatever reasons or diabetic uh, for, for peripheral reasons. Um, it worries me. That's a shark ankle, right? Because she didn't present straight away and was trashing the skin. Oh no, no, no! She she presented. No, she presented immediately. But it's just she had the blisters, and despite putting yeah. the X fix on, it took a very long time. And we do, we do see them occasionally. Yeah, mm-hmm. they do. So we we get about two or three a year where we can't go in straight away. Um, our span we span with a. a Instead of using metal, we use white stuff like the plaster cast, and that's how we span. Uh, and it's very simple and straightforward, and supports the soft tissues, uh, which is the other part we didn't talk about. It's just that support of the soft tissues. If you've got a well contoured back slab, you you could as long as it axially it's reasonably out to length, then you support all of those. And then wait, and and that's where I might go to a posterior approach because often that's that's the skin at the front is awful, but you can go post-remedial where the skin is often excluded from that horrible hemorrhagic blister. Or if you're doing a flap, your, your plates go in at the time of the flap. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. Any questions for the fall from Neymar? So the definite good alternative technique, particularly with those nasty sort of tissues. Thanks very much, Neymar. Thank you.